Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event to the first for 2021 on the 5th of January. Thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening. It's really appreciated. And uh, it's um, quite interesting just seeing everything that's going on at the moment. A lot to talk about. Um, I've got a lot of new data, of course, to share. And uh, as normal, I will start the show with just some input relating to the analysis that I've done, my models, and then we will go forward from there and uh, answer some of the questions that uh, you may pose and uh, also perhaps uh, pick up a few of the questions I received beforehand. Um, always plenty going on on the show, of course, so it's uh, pretty good. And um, hopefully you can see everything running smoothly. I think I've got everything in the right place, but you know, with all of these things, it's all uh, of a one-man operation so things could of course um, go a little bit awry. Anyway, in terms of the running order for today, um, as normal it's the old faithful, this introduction, I'll quickly cover the house rules, I'll talk about our models briefly, I'll uh, then go through some key slides. Questions and answers, uh, if you've got specific questions for me, hold off at the moment, I'm not going to be looking at the chat in detail until I've finished my slides. So if you've got a burning question, hold on to it. And then we'll sign off. And as normal, just to say this is not financial advice. Um, I have to say this every time just to reinforce the fact that it's model based. It's based on my deep research and all the stuff that I do, but I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not qualified to give financial advice and I don't understand your individual circumstances. So don't construe it as financial advice if you need that. You need a financial advisor. But nevertheless, um, it is uh, useful because we can share data together. Please play nice in the chat room. No racial slurs. We are moderating the chat as always. And this is, no it isn't, this is as at, <laughs> whoops, sorry about that. This is as at the 5th of January 2021. Clearly I didn't update this slide in time. But use that walk the world to get my attention, specifically because there is always plenty of stuff going on in the chat and I really won't have a chance to look at everything that's going on. So it's good to um, really understand the um, cross conversations. But if you want to ask me a question, use that walk the world just to be clear and then there's no issue. And I have enabled Super Chat, so if you want to make sure that your question goes to the top of the list, you can use the Super Chat to do that. Super Chat means that uh, your question really jumps out. Or if you want to make a contribution to supporting DFA and what it does, this isn't a for-profit entity. It is sharing information because I think it's really important to share it. So if you'd like to help contribute to keeping us afloat, as it were, that would be much appreciated too. And just in terms of, um, by way of background, uh, we use our core market model. Uh, you may well be aware, but just for those who may not be, that we research quite deeply. We survey households, rolling 52,000 households each year. And uh, that means it's more than 4,000 each month. And we put that into our core market model with a lot of other information. And that means that we've got information that's very up to date. And that's important specifically now because things are moving so quickly. And we can slice and dice the data all different ways by types of household through our segmentation, geographic segmentation, and also property segmentation as well. Which means that we can talk about uh, what's going on at a granularly um, fashion. And, you know, granularity is one of my watchwords, as you'll be aware. Also, the core market model then drives our scenarios and we do have some views as to where prices may go. They are scenarios, they're indicators, they're not meant to be definitive, but they are meant to get us thinking about the different solutions that may be there down the track. And I'd also make the point that our core market model powers our home price scenarios, taking our mortgage stress, the price trajectory, the buying and selling intentions, the migration data, and the economic data, that's things like CPI, wages and employment, put that into the core market model and via our scenarios. And that means that we can then at a postcode level and roll it up to a region, a state on all Australia level, talk about price trajectory over the next two or three years. And uh, we'll share some of that data tonight. But before we do that, just a few things to talk about. The first is that the monthly ADI statistics came out yesterday from APRA. 
And, um, you know, it's interesting because we had the RBA stats before the end of the new year and uh, we had these uh, after the new year. But anyway, we've got them now. And interestingly, uh, well, mortgage lending is up. In fact, it's up 0.7% over the month. Um, if you look at the total portfolio held amongst banks um, and within that, it was unoccupied lending rather than investment lending, which grew the most. And so the share of investment lending is actually lower than it was previously, heading down towards 35.5%. Still massive, still double what it is in the UK. So we still have a massive investment sector, but it's shrinking. And I can also now look at the percentage movement. So unoccupied lending for banks went up by 1.08% over the month, which is very significant. The investment lending went up by 0.21%. And so the overall loan portfolio rose by 0.77%. Now that's, of course, a net number. That includes also loans being repaid, as well as new loans being drawn down, refinancing, and also people repaying nothing at all because they're still on a principal and interest repayment holiday. But that's the net position. And that, of course, is based on the reports that get sent to APRA by the banks. It doesn't include the non-bank sector, which is going quite strongly at the moment. And that's one of the reasons why some of the RBA figures are even stronger than the APRA figures. Now, we can also look at portfolio movements of individual lenders, and I've just picked out a few. Commonwealth was actually the lender that grew their portfolio the most. And you can see both the owner-occupied and investment lending was pretty strong, particularly owner-occupied lending. Macquarie was also pretty strong, not quite as strong, but you can see that their investment portfolio grew even more. So they're actually lending very hard for investment purposes at the moment. ANZ ditto. So ANZ is growing its investment portfolio relative to its own occupied portfolio more than the other three that we've looked at. And then Bendico, mostly on own occupied lending, but with a little bit of investment. Now, National Investment, National Australia Bank is quite interesting because own occupied lending is strong, but investment lending is going backwards. So they're actually net losers on investment. And then Bank of Queensland did mostly own occupied with a bit of investment loan. Westpac this time did increase own occupied lending. In the last few months they've been shrinking, but investment lending also dropped. So it's quite interesting comparing CBA and ANZ, both increasing their investment loans, whereas NAB and Westpac aren't. ING a bit the same and then we've got some smaller players like Citigroup, HSBC and Rabobank and then Suncorp is right there over on the right hand side very little movement okay now let me then touch on household debt to income this is the RBA ratios that came out recently and the overall household debt to income ratio is dropped it's actually dropped down to 179 it's interesting because what that means is that people are paying down some debts. But then if you look at that for housing loans, it didn't drop as much. And if you look at it for owner-occupied housing debt, in fact, that's on the way up. It's at 98. So that shows you that while some households are paying down some debts, owner-occupied lending is still pretty strong. And also today we got from APRA the latest loan repayment deferral data dropped down to about 2% of loans outstanding now. And interestingly, this data shows you that there is still some new and extended loans being made, although some are actually also being expired or uh, exited. And you can see there that both SMEs and housing loans are actually dropping and the number of facilities are down. More housing relative to SME, more over 2% relative to 1.5% for SMEs. And in terms of risk profiles, what's quite interesting there is that we've still got more loans with a higher loan to value ratio that's exposed relative to the others. And we also have quite a few people still making partial repayments rather than full repayments. But of course, that's sufficient to keep them out of um, default effectively. And across the states, there are some significant variations. Victoria was leading the way uh, a little easier now, of course, both on SMEs and household deferrals for loans. And by individual lender, in fact, the ANZ and Westpac have the largest footprint of deferred loans. 
and Bank of Queensland uh, also up there, some of the others less so. And ANZ actually has the prize for the largest share of both SME and housing deferred. But again, you can see there the different profiles. So things are back, but there's still this core of people who are unable to restart repaying their loans. And of course, this is up to the end of November. In December, we also have more people being caught up with more lockdowns again. So be interesting to see what happens ahead. Now, let me just briefly touch on mortgage stress. It is slightly in December. And this is the chart uh, that really takes us into it. So we're at 41.1% now. That was at 41.6% last month. So it's come back just slightly, but it's still a lot higher than in February when it was 32.9%. So the net effect of COVID is a considerably larger number of people having difficulty with their mortgages. And of course, as people um, are being encouraged to start repaying, some of those are actually struggling. And like I said, the debt to income ratio for from the Reserve Bank dropped to 159.9. So it's down a bit, which is weird given all the uh, other issues that we saw a little while ago. Now, by state, um, you can see there that it varies. But if you look firstly at the mortgage stress data, uh, that is this one here. You can see that at 41.1% for the whole of Australia, Victoria and Tasmania lead the way. Tasmania still has the highest amount of stress in the system. And that's not helped by the fact that prices for houses are still rising quite fast in Tasmania. Uh, it's also worth highlighting that the situation in Victoria may be on the turn, but it's yet really to translate into anything noticeable in terms of improvement. New South Wales a bit lower at 39 and uh, then South Australia, of course, is up there as well. And then we've got uh, some other states that are a little lower. Now, if you look at rental stress, so this is the same cash flow issues, and we always measure stress in cash flow terms. You can see there that New South Wales at 49% has this most significant footprint of rental stress. Overall, across Australia, it's 35, but it's 49% in New South Wales. In Victoria, it's 37. In Queensland, it's 33. And then some of the other states, a little less. If you would then turn to property investor stress, we can see there that overall it's at 27%. So it's continuing to rise slightly, in fact. And the highest stress levels are both in the ACT and in New South Wales. So investors in those two states in particular are really under the gun at the moment. Then Victoria as well and Queensland. Some of the other states are a little less of an issue. Um, WA, of course, um, beginning to see a bit of a turnaround, but so far it's not really um, showing up in the mortgage stress data, nor indeed in the investor stress. And then finally, we measure financial stress, which is the overall, uh, overall aggregate level based on all of the households in the particular state. And there, the average across Australia is at 38%. And the highest amounts of financial stress are in the ACT and in New South Wales. Victoria is at 40%. It's pretty high. Then we have WA and we have Queensland. Northern Territory a little lower. South Australia also quite low. So that's the overall situation. So overall net, some changes. And to be honest, um, movements up, movements down. But the net moments, mo momentum at a postcode level we'll touch on in a moment shows there have been some quite interesting changes. Now, if I look quickly at segments, and again, these are our master segments that we always use, 41.1% in mortgage stress. But let me just highlight young growing families. They are by far the most stressed households with a mortgage. That's a big deal. Um, we've also got a lot of people on the urban fringe who are also in difficulty. Quite a few of them bought modern houses on uh, modern developments quite recently with big mortgages. And are struggling and some of them also bought um, units rather than houses of course and then you've got some other segments so some wealthy seniors not doing quite so badly the young affluents not doing quite so badly but i'd also highlight there that the exclusive professionals those with the more affluent households are still in some difficulty 
With regard to rental stress, it's a bit like the same story. Young growing families at 39%, young affluents at 50 so there are many more young affluents renting, and many of them are renting more expensive apartments. So that's one of the reasons why we're seeing that. And we've also got some exclusive professionals, as well as some more mature households in rental stress. Investors, pretty much uh, it does vary by segment again, but you can see a lot of young affluents are significantly stressed and that's because quite a few of them bought into highly leveraged investment properties two or three years ago and they're now finding that the rentals are dropping and the value of the property is also dropping. Exclusive professionals are a bit the same, some other segments a little bit the same and you can see there the overall financial stress metrics again does vary by segment but the point I want to stress with this is you cannot associate overall financial stress with one particular segment there are a whole bunch of different mechanisms going on across the different segments, which explains why we get different outcomes. Now, in terms of locations, just briefly, and today I'm looking at the total number of households in each category sorted with the biggest count. Firstly, mortgage stress. So 6065, which includes Tapping and Wanneroo, has more than 10,000 households now in stress. That, of course, in WA, where house prices are on the turn. That's a problem. Then we go up to Toowoomba with 9,800. Then we go across to New South Wales to 2560, which includes Campbelltown and places like that, 9,600. Then we go to Fountain Gate, Narrow Warren in Victoria, 3805 with 8,800. Then we go to Ballarat to 7,700. Sydenham in Victoria, 7,500. Cranbourne, in Victoria, 7,300. Tamala Park, Queens Rock, Meriwa in WA, 7,100. Derriment Point Cook, 6,900. And Pakenham, 6,800. You can read the rest there. Now, quite a few of these are high growth corridors around the urban centres, quite close to the urban fringe. And a lot of them are characterised by lots of new properties being built quite frequently, close together, quite recently, highly mortgaged and people in difficulty. If I then look at rental stress, same sort of scenario, the total rental count. In fact, 2540, which includes places like Sussex Inlet, Inlet um, Swanhaven, places like that, uh, are actually right up there. Jarvis Bay included in that large area at 9,400. Then we go to West Gosford, which is up in the central coast at 8,900. Then we go to Mount Druitt and places like that, 2770 at 8,700. Then we go to Greystains, another New South Wales postcode of 2145 with 8725. Then we go to 2560, which includes again Campbelltown, sounds familiar, 8,000. Then we go to um, the next one, like Shelley Beach, um, Batu Bay, places like that, in 2261, that's through 7,300. And then we come into Sydney 2000, which includes obviously The Rocks, Sydney CBD itself, Haymarket, Millers Point, places like that, 7,300. Now a lot of that is apartments, of course. Ditto South Yarra, 7,200. Then we go across to Parramatta at 7,000. And then we go to Toowoomba at 6,900, and so it goes on. So again, you can see a bit of an interesting footprint. So there are people in some of the rural areas and some of the um, regional areas that are in financial stress from a rental perspective. We've got people in high-rise apartments closer into the city, and we've got people living in the urban fringe renting houses, and that's the reason why we've got this rather significant mix. If I then look at investor stress, now just to be clear, this is where the property investors are living. It doesn't necessarily mean this is where they have their investment property. And the postcode with the highest investor stress location count is Surrey Hills and Darlinghurst, 2010. And then Greystains at 3,652, which includes Wentworthville and Westmead. And then we go to Millbank up in Queensland, and then we go 
um, to St George's Basin, Sanctuary Point and Jarvis Bay. And then we go to places like Labrador up in Queensland, Randwick and, Randwick and Clovelly in New South Wales, Paradise Point and South Stradbrook in Queensland, Mermaid Water in Queensland, Cranbourne in Victoria, Rushcusser's Bay, close into the centre of Sydney. And then we've got places like Mandra. Uh, and, you know, I keep coming back to Mandra as one of those areas where people still have significant issues. Remember that in Mandra they've lost value for quite a few years, so many investment properties are underwater. And we can go down the list to places like Campbelltown there and uh, Toowoomba, Crow's Nest, St Leonard's, Narraburn as well. So there are definitely some significant footprints. And again, you can tie, like, tie this back to property investors who've invested both in high-rise and also in houses out on the urban fringe. And finally, financial stress. Overall, the highest financial stress, taking account of all the factors, is 2560, which is uh, Campbelltown, at more than 20,000 households. Then we go to Toowoomba, 19,500. Then we go to Mount Druitt, places like that, in 17291. Then we go to Cranbourne in Victoria, one of those very high growth areas at 17,200. Then we go to Ballarat, 15,000. Fountain Gate at 14,009. Hoppers Crossing is there as well. Dermot Point Cook. And so it goes down the list. Now, the point I want to make about all this information is that it is all to do with cash flow. This is money in, money out. So it doesn't mean necessarily they're going to fall over immediately. But households in financial stress will be more likely to sell rather than buy, will be trying to restructure their finances, may even put more on deposits, uh, on deposit accounts, pull out money from deposit accounts, put more on credit cards to try and deal with their situation. So this tells you something about the dynamics of property prices in some of these areas, and that's one of the factors that goes into my model, which I'll discuss in a moment or two. Now, just before I do that, let me just uh, touch on a couple of the slides. Just standing back, it is worth thinking about this, that central banks are absolutely having a party. Look at the liquidity that's been injected in recent months. Massive amounts, and it's not stopping yet. And I did a post yesterday about whether, in fact, this is going to mark the continued rise of the stock market over the next few minutes. Will, will actually continue to grow and become an issue, or will the market continue to rise higher? We'll still see. Also, it's worth looking at this slide. I was looking at this the other day. NASDAQ now versus from 1996. And basically, there's a similar path happening. So on this particular chart, some of the analysts are saying, well, see, the NASDAQ's got plenty more headroom following what it did from 1996 to 2000. So we'll see about that. Not sure. But um, there are arguments for significant price rises and for a correction, so far as markets are concerned. We'll see. And, of course, the markets wobbled today, um, both in the US and locally. Now, Qantas has announced that they are intending to start selling international flights from July. And they obviously believe that the point here is that it looks as though they believe that they'll be able to start flying simply because the vaccines will be there. Not everywhere, but they're talking to the US and the UK. They're taking bookings, return, returnable to bookings, of course. And that tells you something important about their thinking with regard to timing. Originally, they were talking about international flights at the end of the year, so they've been bringing it forward. And now, in terms of that's important to factor into our scenarios, which are ways of exploring what's going on. Um, I'm not necessarily saying this is the way it's going to be, but it's just testing different scenarios. None of these scenarios may be right, and we run them forward from today. So let me show you where we are. So this is important. We've now got to the point where the best case, the COVID vaccination scenario, has a 40% weighting, which is the same as the longer term crunch weighting. Now that's a big deal because until quite recently, I was arguing that the longer term crunch was the most likely scenario. Now it looks to me, with all of the fiscal and QE and everything else, remember that the RBA is pumping in 0.6 billion of GDP into the uh, system at the minute, and we'll go on doing that for some time. That's going to support, and in fact, 
is case, then there is a chance that prices will be higher over the next couple of years. On the other hand, if in fact we get the longer term crunch and we get more infections and we find that the South African virus comes through and all those sorts of things, then we could still be down in the longer term crunch scenario. And I've still left the multi-wave disruption there because there are still some worrying signs of the virus not going away. But nevertheless, for the first time in quite a long time, this second scenario, which is of the three that I use in my modelling, which is the base case, the best case, the, the mid case, and then the worst case, the three in the middle, it's now tied. And that's not happened for some time, so that's quite significant, and that gives me a view of a more positive view with regard to prices. Okay, and I would say that uh, I can now start to share with you some of the modelling information. And um, one of the interesting things there at this model, if I just load it up, let's see whether it comes up, should do hopefully. Okay, <laughs> well, it nearly did. Just one second, let me just uh, put that back on there, and then I'm going to move that over to there. If I go there, and I'll do that. Okay, so we now have our postcode model actually on screen. So let me put that up. So just to explain, this model actually contains all of the information in our core market model. And I'll just show you, this is the sort of stuff that we can pull out of it. So this now shows you the trends data. And like I said, we've now got the blue line being at the same probability as the dotted line, um, whereas the worst case scenario is now less tuned. So for each postcode, we now know the households, we know the stress data, and we know the trajectory. So all of those things are now in the model. And what that basically means is that we can delve into information if people want to go there. Um, the information will also shortly be available more broadly, and I'll talk about that uh, a little later. Okay, so there we go. That's some um, just sort of starting the conversation. What I might go now is to go back and have a quick look at some of the comments, see what we've got, and uh, maybe start with some of the earlier ones, and we'll go back through there. There's quite a few. Um, Fat Cat made a very good point. Uh, Noddy McDonald is open in the UK. Utter disaster. It is utter disaster. Um, it's been mismanaged, I think, for months in the UK. I've also spoken to a number of people who live there, and it's very, very, very concerning as to what's going on. Um, they're also now talking about the new strain of the virus being significantly more infectious. Now, whether that's true or not um, is an interesting observation, but that's certainly what they're positioning at as at the moment. Um, now, Mr. James, um, when's the house market going to crash? Keen to buy a house at a discount? Well, you know, interesting question. My modelling is now suggesting that the chances of price rises from this point rather than falls are definitely different from where they were even two or three months ago. But it really does come back to the virus. The question about the virus is, is it going to get um, fixed up or not? Because if it's not, then the economy is not going to function properly. And in fact, in the last two weeks, I actually saw some significant evidence of more negativity, both in terms of buyer intent, SME, and also um, in property investor intent, which suggests that the question about the health is connected to the economy. Now, of course, the governments will go on throwing stimulus at it. The question is, will that be sufficient to maintain the momentum? My own view is this. There is still significant downside to the property markets. And even in my scenario, and I'll just go back to uh, this particular one for a second, even this, in this scenario, there's very limited upside for, um, I'm looking at New South Wales 2000 for houses, I'm saying basically over the next two or three years, you know, there's a few percent, not a lot. 
Um, there's still significant risk on the downside if the if the virus comes back. And just to explain the scenarios, the best case scenario is that the vaccines get rolled out quickly, the international borders open in the middle of the year, and essentially international travel, including students, all starts and we start getting migration back in. Now it's worth reflecting on the fact that the budget that the Treasury published earlier on had no migration next year, or well, net migration negative. So interesting to see whether they update that. Um, units, again, a bit of a fall and then a rise. So that's how that plays out for this particular postcode. Um, the point to make there is that it's still a very much it depends scenario. What we do know is that the um, government is continuing to pump in terms of trying to support the economy, particularly the Reserve Bank. But we also know that JobKeeper and JobSeeker is being scaled back and certainly one of the big factors in my stress data is the removal of government support from a bunch of different households. Now, this takes me to what I call my K-shaped recovery. There is no doubt that there is a proportion of the population who are doing extremely well. They've been able to save. The interest rate cuts have actually translated to lower mortgage repayments and they're still in work and they're doing really well. And in fact, they're feeling very positive and more likely to perhaps buy. There's also another sector of the economy, which is the negative side, so that's the other leg of the K, where they are still struggling with regards to lower levels of income or higher levels of unemployment. Remember, unemployment's still a lot higher than it was. And they're really struggling to know what they're going to do. And many of them are actually in rental accommodation. They're looking to move to cheaper rental accommodation or move back with parents if they can. And so we've got this bifurcation going on between the two ends of the economy. Now, what's interesting is the relative distribution is two-thirds are doing well, one-third is not doing well. And that's a worry because what that means is that if, when the next election comes, the government is able to persuade the two-thirds to vote for them, they're going to get back no problem at all. And I worry that essentially we've lost sight of a considerable proportion of the population who are really doing it tough and frankly who are not being adequately supported. And in that sort of K one-third, the down K, that includes a lot of small businesses, self-employed people and sole traders who are not able to access JobKeeper and whose businesses are still being significantly impacted by all of the trade slowdown. So that's the problem that I see. I see this bifurcation and I see all the focus on the upside with the sort of the two thirds that are doing quite well. And next week, I'm going to go into much more detail on this because I want to show the latest financial confidence data, which really reinforces this. There are some groups that are really much more positive now than they were, but there are also other groups that are much less positive. And that's the problem trying to look at an aggregate data set when there's such big diversity. So that's something else, I think, to bear in mind. Let's have a look here. This is an interesting comment. Um, Kosa, um, house prices can't grow unabated forever. Well, I tend to agree with you. Remember that we've seen interest rates drop from well, say 10% right the way down. Um, they're now pretty much as low as they can go. There might be a little bit of wobble, but not a lot. And frankly, even if they take rates negatives, they probably will. I'm still expecting negative interest rates over the next um, year or two. Um, we're at the, bot at the bottom of the curve in terms of mortgage rate reduction. So a lot of the momentum has been driven by lower rates. But momentum is also being driven by the fact that, of course, Lenders now are getting much more um, aggressive in their lending again, and the responsible lending rules that were in place are being abolished in March, unless we can do something about that, which is subject for another show later, I think, because what is being changed is that all the responsible lending obligations now are being put back on borrowers rather than on lenders. In other words, if a lender is able to lend a loan, it's up to the borrower to make sure that they can actually repay the loan, whereas today there is some responsibility on the lend lender not to lend irresponsibly. So that's a concern. Now, the reason I've gone down this route is because price growth for houses is driven by credit. 
It's driven by demand, which includes international demand, particularly from overseas investors and migrants, and also lending capacity. So if lending capacity continues to rise, if investment momentum starts to rise because we get international investors coming back and we get more demand for property, then yeah, prices could rise. But you know, how much is too much? Well, prices are 40% over the fundamental long-term values in Australia at the moment, 40%. So the more that you go above the long-term trend, the more likely it will come back at some point. And it's just a question of timing. And, you know, people keep saying, well, you know, we've been saying this for a long time. Well, I have, yes. But I'd also make the point that we continue to see more government stimulus. You know, they've done the home builder thing and they've um, uh, given the banks lots of very cheap money to lend on and from the Reserve Bank, all lots of other things to try and support the property sector. And I've said on a number of occasions, the problem with that is that ultimately, eventually, this runs out of runway. And until then, sure, more people will be reeled in, more people will be up to their eyes in debt. Remember what I said, 40.1% of households in financial difficulty at the moment. That's a big number. Um, we're seeing more people who bought recently falling into it as well. So that's the problem I've got. So there is a limit. I don't know where the limit is. But the fact is, the fact is that there will be some upward pressure. Now, I think it's a few percent. I don't think it's going to be a massive rise. Nowhere are we going to see this sort of doubling in seven years, which, of course, is the old myth of uh, property prices. I keep proving that it's not, never happened when I look at real data. Remember the other point. Many people are selling properties today are selling them at a loss. And there's a bunch of data. Cookie Boy's been very um, productive at throwing some of that data in my direction. I will make some more shows about that in due course. There are huge examples of people selling and losing capital when they sell. And so that's the other factor to bear in mind. Um, this is not a one-way street. It's not that prices can go unabated forever, particularly when wages are going nowhere. International movement in is pretty much zero and where we have an oversupply of properties, which we do at the moment, particularly apartments. <laughs> this is regional conversation here. Um, I've just seen regional houses in Victoria jump 50 to 100k since the pandemic started. Right, when I'm about to buy, just a bit annoying. Yeah, well, the regional stuff is really interesting. And I was calling out the movements amongst in regional areas. Um, I did a number of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people over the last few months and called out the fact that in some regional areas, prices were on the rise. Um, regional areas are under significant pressure because a lot of people are moving out from the major cities, um, even across states in some cases. And, of course, prices in those regional centres are just way lower than closer into Sydney. I'm seeing the same thing down here. I live near Wollongong, and we've seen quite a lot of demand for property in this area from people who were living in Sydney previously and are now moving further out because, of course, they can, because they can work from home. They've realised that digital works, so they don't need to uh, essentially travel into the city every day. And so that's part of the rebalancing that's going on. Um, I'm very concerned about local people in the regional areas who are now being priced out and if you want to see what that looks like, look at Hobart and Tasmania, where over the last few years, locals have found it more and more difficult to buy. One of the reasons why mortgage stress in Tasmania is so high, because the only way they can buy is to commit themselves to very large mortgages. And of course, then, because their incomes are relatively constrained, that creates issues. So frankly, just putting prices ever higher and spreading that into regional centres is creating a bigger problem. It's not solving anything, I'm afraid, but you know, that's one of those issues which I'm afraid is the question. And, and Jack asks, house prices aren't growing everywhere. Does your, do your research and find the right area? Well, I agree about that. There are still significant areas where prices are not rising. And the point there is that you have to get granular. You have to actually strip away all the veneer from the property portals that continually say, everything's rising, everything's rising, buy now, buy now. It's funny that. Um, the truth is, real life is not quite like that. There are areas where prices are going up. Houses 
closer into the city in some cases um, are definitely rising. Units, of course, are not, and particularly units further out in the inner suburban ring in many of the major centres are really dropping still, down 20 to 30 percent, probably will drop more. And also even land prices in some areas are still going down. So you've got to go granular, you've got to do the research, and don't be misled by what the property portals are reporting at the aggregate level because they're masking a lot of variations. Cookie Boy says this point. The virus is mutating. I predict years before we see any signs of it dying down. Well, that could well be. Um, that's why one of my scenarios is still the continued wave of more virus infection. Um, you know, what's interesting is the discussion now here that the last couple of um, waves of the virus were triggered by mysterious events. Nobody can quite track back patient zero. Now, was it quarantine or was it something else? We'll have more to say about that down the track. But the fact is there are virants, viruses mutating. Also, remember the vaccine um, is designed to take some of the worst um, of the symptoms away. But nobody knows whether it actually stops the transmission. And there are people who argue that the transmission is still a, 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 is still not symptomatic quite often. And if that's the case, this virus could go on for some long time. I'm afraid that the idea that it will be over by the summer, northern summer, or our winter, is probably very optimistic. But, you know, a lot of people are in that school at the moment, particularly in some of the news columns and particularly, of course, the property sector. Gippsland area... Um, looking for small acreage, less affordable every month. Yep, Gippsland has been one of those areas where there's definitely been some rises, I agree. Now, with regard to the vaccine here locally, of course, um, uh, SCOMO is arguing we should wait and see what happens and go through our normal processes and procedures. It's interesting how the media, particularly some of the um, uh, TV channels, have been now saying, oh, you know, ramp it up, ramp it up, roll out the vaccines earlier. Very interesting looking at what's happened with that. Um, Israel's the country with the largest footprint of um, vaccines um, actually distributed. But uh, the US and the UK are finding the mechanisms of distribution are very complicated and uh, they're not creating the momentum they thought. So there's a lot of planning to be done. And my own view would be that it's probably worth taking our time and getting it right, particularly as we've got some issues here, but not as many as in the UK. But remember that some time ago, the UK was considerably less exposed to the virus than today. And uh, the concern I have is that we may well be in for more waves here in Australia. And if we are in for more waves, then my scenarios of more negative responses to house prices becomes much more relevant. <laughs> Fat Cat makes the point about... Um, uh, sorry, go the right one. Interest rates and deposits are killing any chance your money will make a return. That's absolutely too, um, true. I've seen... Um, um, okay, something strange going on with that uh, particular post. But anyway, the point there is, um, yeah, interest rates significantly um, tending to zero at the moment. And many people that I survey are now saying, well, there's no point in leaving money in the bank. I need to take some market exposure. So, of course, they've been looking at things like Bitcoin. They've been looking at things like um, market uh, trading, stock trading, etc, etc. Of course, the risks are higher there, and that's part of the issue. So do you trade off uh, low returns for higher risks? Well, maybe you do. But of course, if it goes wrong, then that's an issue later. So that's the question. That's the conundrum. And uh, as I keep saying, any asset class, whether it's deposits, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's gold, whether it's stocks, shares, bonds, they all have different risks attached to them, even property has risks attached to them. There is no such thing as a free lunch when it comes to investing. Uh, 
this is KMR makes an interesting point. I'm hearing that households will be able to remain the current debt and the housing market will not so much crash or stagnate for a number of years, at least until wages catch up, hopefully. Yeah, there is, you know, in a way that's one of my central scenarios, right? That in fact, with, with no wage growth, you end up with essentially um, property prices going nowhere particular. Um, I argue that the recent rises were more to do with government intervention, and that's part of the story, of course, but there is a limit to that. And so in the medium term, my own modelling is suggesting still that prices are going to be much more stagnant than we have been used to. So if you're an investor and you're thinking to, of moving into investment property today, you can't really guarantee capital growth from this point. And for many people, um, the truth is that the um, rental returns they're getting on investment properties are falling. And you know, in some cases, it's 10, 15, 20, 25 percent lower than where it was. So for many investors, there's still a significant, very significant drive to sell. But interestingly, and Cookie Boy's been th throwing some data on this, you know, the total listings has dropped dramatically at the moment, parts partly because of Christmas and New Year. It will be very interesting to see what happens down the track with regard to um, listings in the new year. My surveys are still suggesting that uh, you will see more listings coming back because of forced sales and that you will see property investors in particular leading the charge, particularly units. But we'll see. <laughs> yep, World Economic Forum. Um, I did actually do a post on that the other day. Um, you know, scary um, um, dream of a future which is not a one that I want to be part of. It's interesting now that a lot of people are talking about this, which is probably a good thing. Um, but, uh, you know, there's still a significant risk that the guys um, in the expensive chairs um, will want to try and pr produce a future where they do well and everybody else doesn't. And unfortunately, part of that future could be change in ownership rules and indeed um, own, owning nothing and props digitally enabled through AI as uh, the economic forum is discussing. We'll keep an eye on that and we'll come back to that later on. And Jack says, I can't see any reason why wages go up regionally. We've got cheaper ladies nearby. Yeah, there is almost no evidence that I can see for any wages growth at the moment. And in fact, the Reserve Bank has forecast down wages growth from this point. Many companies are squeezing wages and of course some of the recent negotiations with regard to terms and conditions are also effectively net negative to wages growth. So I think wages growth is absolutely um, you know, squeezed out for some long time. That's a big deal because of course in the early 90s we had high debt mortgage debt but we have significant wages grow so people were able to effectively grow the way out of their mortgage problem that doesn't happen these days that's one of the reasons why our stress numbers are so high that's a big deal and just a quick acknowledgement tony lecancho hello tony nice to see you on the stream tonight looking forward to your coming on in uh, um, a couple of weeks time to talk about uh, what uh, you're seeing, so that'll be that'll be fun. I think we're on the about the 26th, I think, isn't it? Which is Australia Day. So look forward to that. That should be fun. Now, Sunshine Girl makes the point that investors are coming back into the market in WA because rents are going higher and higher, and there are no rental vacancies. Yeah, absolutely, a big turnaround in Western Australia, but not uniformly across the whole of WA. I think you'll find that there are particular postcodes in and around Perth where that's true. I'm looking at some of the regional centres where there's a whole new different story going on. Um, remember, of course, though, that property has dropped, you know, significantly. So Mandurah prices have dropped, what, 30 to 40 percent from their peak. Uh, the average rentals dropped by up to 50 percent. So they're just coming up a little. So it's back to um, where they were. Nevertheless, um, some property investors from the East Coast are now looking at the West Coast as a way to invest. And that, for me, is just one of those, well, would you believe it? Yes, I would believe it. So a lot of people who've sold in Sydney and Melbourne, um, you know, they're now looking in Perth, places like that. Uh, 
interesting comment there. Well, I'm not persuading people to buy or not buy. I'm just trying to give people more information to be able to make a decision. You have to make the decision whether you buy or whether you don't buy. And I've argued consistently there are reasons why you would still buy property even if prices weren't going to rise. Um, you know, somewhere to live, those sorts of things. So I am just trying to share information which hopefully will give people more balanced view than many people who essentially have um, perhaps been persuaded by the mainstream or by the property portals. <laughs> yep, buying is better than renting. Maybe. Depends on whether you think prices are going to go up, going to go down. I know that there are a number of people renting locally in Sydney who've done a lot better than if they'd bought. So I think it does depend where in the country, what type of property, and a bunch of other things. Again, I think generic statements are always risky. You need to go granular and really look at the individual situation, I think. Okay. What else have we got? <laughs> Dustin said, five years mortgage stress, 80% house prices going up. Well, who knows? I mean, remember that mortgage stress is, a, is all about cash flow, right? So if interest rates continue to fall and mortgages go up a bit, people can still sort of worry through. And the point about mortgage stress is it, builds over time, right? So a lot of the stress we're seeing now was actually created by decisions made two or three years ago when prices were booming, when banks were willing to lend, all of those things. So it takes time for this to work through. And it'll be the same ahead. You know, I don't, I don't think we're going to get to 80% mortgage stress. I've always thought that 40% of thereabouts is probably where it's going to get to and then begin to taper back. But it does depend... And it depends also how much government support is going to come in. You know, will they extend JobKeeper and JobSeeker further? They probably will. There's probably going to be an election in what later in the year, maybe October, something like that. So there probably will be more support for the next few months. So that's pro one of the things which will perhaps keep people in their properties. Who knows? And uh, as Michael makes the point, the trend in mortgage stress, is, is it going up? Yes, it is going up. Yep, well, it's, it's peaked now. Um, wouldn't the longer, in the longer term negative cash flow mean they're going to run out of money? Well, what they do is a series of things. So I'm looking on a cash flow basis. So they tap into credit cards. So you see credit card debt rising. And interestingly, whilst overall credit card debt is dropping, there are pockets where it's rising. And a lot of those pockets are people who guess what, are in mortgage stress. We also see them use things like afterpay to so spread payments out. Uh, they can also refinance, and so that's one of the things you quite often see. One of the early signs of mortgage stress is a series of refinancing events, and quite often people pull out a bit of equity if they've got equity in the property, and then pay off their debts, but then actually start the cycle again. So you, what you see is you see mortgage stress effectively continuing and perpetuating because people don't change their habits. They don't change their style in terms of how they actually um, uh, operate their, their finances. And only half the people that I survey actually have cash flows, so they really don't know what they're spending, right? So that's the point there. Ultimately, you're right, though, people get to the point where they run out of options. But that can be a three- to five-year journey very uncomfortable journey, one which often includes some resets, some refinances, um, some you know a few credit cards here and there. But ultimately, then people um, have to get out. Now, what happens until quite recently was they would sell, and because prices were rising, they created sufficient equity to repay the bank, repay the debts, and so there wasn't a forced sale. And that's one of the things I really want to highlight that. All of the metrics that measure forced sales is only measuring the tip of the problem and the very small point. Now, default rates are, what, 1% thereabouts. It's going up, and we'll see more of defaults ahead, I think. But it's that other group who get themselves into financial difficulty, end up paying more and more of their income to support their mortgages, end up with lots of debts, and ultimately sell and get out. Now, they can repay the banks, so the bank's fine. But those households are the one that get into terrible difficulty. And my worry is that many people walk into a mortgage 
without having done the work in terms of cash flow, without asking the hard questions about what if my job you know, turns um, south or whatever. Uh, and so they tend to sort of just walk in in a positive spirit, not thinking it through. So what I keep saying to people is build a cash flow. And just because the bank says you can borrow doesn't necessarily mean that you should borrow. Maybe it's best to borrow less. Um, now, you know, that's an unpopular thing to say because people obviously want to uh, buy the biggest place they can with the, you know, the most shiny this and the sh most shiny that. Sometimes that isn't the best strategy. So, yeah, I think people need to pay much, much more attention of the first transaction as they walk into property, trying to solve financial stress and mortgage stress once they've got the property is much more complicated. And I do quite a lot of work with debt counsellors and quite a few of the debt counsellors basically say, the problem was created on day, on step one, day one, when they committed. And from the rest of the time, they always knew ultimately it was going to fall apart. But long term, not short term necessarily. An interesting question. Yeah, peak debt. Yeah, I'm not sure. Peak debt. I think we're still going to see debt rising high. Remember I showed you that chart where owner-occupied debt still rising? We're going to see that rising even more. The, the banks, the government, everybody wants you to borrow more because that will create more activity. Well, more housing activity at least. It won't necessarily create good economic activity for the broader country, but that's another story. So I expect debt to be even higher. Mr. Negative says there'll be higher prices when we get negative rates. Well, yeah, so there's negative rates will operate at two levels. Firstly, at the wholesale level. So in other words, the Reserve Bank will charge retail banks um, for holding money with the central bank, just like they've done in Europe, which forces the banks to try and lend. Right? That's the first step. That doesn't necessarily translate into negative rates at the retail level. Then over time, if that continues, what tends to happen is you then end up with the um, thought that some people with big deposits start having to be have to pay for them. Quite often it's a fee rather than a negative interest rate. Um, there are a few examples of negative rates on mortgages, but if you look at the whole package, like in some of Scandinavian countries, there are massive fees that are also charged. So in fact, you're still paying. So I don't believe the idea that they'll pay you to borrow more money um, for a mortgage. That isn't the way it's going to work. So there are limits, but it they definitely will provide some headroom. But remember, we're close to zero now, so there isn't a lot of wobble room, in my view, to go deeply negative. Master Singleton makes the point. Victor, Victorian's economy is not as healthy compared to 10 years ago. I think that's probably true for most parts of the country, if I'm honest. If you look at the amount of debt that we've now got, if you look at the amount of um, wasted stuff that's going on, I think it's a big deal. We've also got, of course, all of the broader issues with regard to the environment and those sorts of things too. Um, and we are very reliant on a very narrow base. We have one of the narrowest base economies globally. And that's because, of course, we are basically resource, agriculture, a few other things, and tourism, uh, education, now, some of those, of course, are really under some difficulty. Now, of course, the exchange rate is quite interesting because the exchange rate's moved up quite high. It's 77 at the moment to US, which means that essentially we are importing deflation rather than inflation and our goods are costing more to export. So that could have an interesting effect as well. So I think, yes, we are poorly positioned. I also would argue that we've had a very poor set of political leaders for quite some time who are not taking the strategic issues that should be seriously considered. As a result of that, um, we are digging a hole for ourselves that's uh, quite significant. Um, needs a whole new different way of thinking in my view, but I guess it's easy for me to say it from here. The majority of mortgage stress in Victoria where people were sucked into the building Ponzi. Yep, exactly right. That's exactly right. We're seeing it again and again and again. High density, new estates on small plots, you know, shiny new places because people always want to buy new. Don't know why, because you lose 10% as soon as you move in and it suddenly is no longer new and therefore you have to uh, take a hit. Um, very interesting looking at old, older properties listed in areas where there's a new development, they see prices drop. 
because essentially what happens is people prefer new rather than old. Big issue, and yeah, these high density, high high um, growth corridors, nightmare should never have been allowed to happen. But hey. And it's just worth uh, highlighting the fact that it is ethnically quite mixed in some of those areas. We have a big migration, of course. We have a lot of people from overseas countries buying in those areas. And they actually will be attracted by the sort of properties there. Remember I said though, net migration definitely on the way down. So that could well be one of the reasons why we will see significant problems in those areas. Okay. And Master Singleton, yeah, it's very interesting looking at some of that data that I showed where in fact we have um, some significant socio and economic challenges in those areas. And by the way, more broadly, what I can say is that the impact of COVID and the financial impact of COVID is going back to my K-shaped. Um, analysis is much, much more hitting the lower socioeconomic groups, those who are effectively uh, on lower incomes, less stable incomes than everybody else. And that's one of the things I think the socioeconomic impact of this is an area where a lot more study needs to be done because, frankly, it is definitely an issue. Cookie Boy says Manda is picking up according to the AFR. Well, you're sure. Picking up from where? From its very, very low level from last year, right? So it's still way down from where it was. If you do some of the analysis, Cookie Boy, of house price sales in Mandra, you'll see people are still selling at a loss. So it's all relative. But of course, that doesn't make the headline in the paper. Okay. What else have we got? Lots of conversations. I'm looking for the ones that um, addressed to me, but a lot of people are just chatting with each other, so that's fine. I'm very happy for you to do that. Ah, I saw a postcode question. Let's see whether I can pick that one up. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Just seeing what else is there. Quite a few conversations. One of the little annoyances about the chat is that it jumps around a bit sometimes, so I may have missed a few. Hang on. Okay, let me tr go the other way. Um, From Cookie Boy. Thanks, Cookie. Could we see the RBA pull the pin on devaluing the euro dollar to keep the US? Yeah. Well, the Reserve Bank has said specifically that it does not want to intervene in the markets um, because uh, what it wants to do is to uh, make sure that uh, you know the markets are the markets, right? And of course, it costs a lot to try and take the dollar lower. They want the dollar at about fifty-five. It's a 75 or 77 at the moment. That's way too high. And I have a feeling that with the US dollar weakening, as it probably will ahead, if you look at the cross rates, that's what's happening. Um, it's going to be very hard to see our dollar drop. I wouldn't be surprised to see it around 18. And that's really bad for us insofar that it stops the economy functioning the way that the Reserve Bank would want it to. Now, will they intervene? Possibly they will. But one, it'll cost a lot. And two, can you buck the markets? I'm not sure you can. So I'm not sure that that will be particularly useful. But we'll see. All right. What else have we got? Otto says the bank will never pay borrowers to take out a mortgage. If they did, they would quickly go broke. Yeah, I agree. The point there, of course, is that banks in Europe are actually being given money and frankly paid to lend at really low rates. So that's part now of the ECB is supporting the profitability of banks um, 
directly as well as indirectly. So they're providing really cheap money and they're also paying them to lend that money. Um, we could see similar shenanigans here, of course. But nevertheless, I do believe that there is a zero bound. I also believe that, uh, and all the research in Europe that I've been looking at suggests that you can't take deposit rates into zero and below because people just take money out of the system. And uh, that's not good from a liquidity standpoint. So I think there are some zero bounds that we have to come to. And therefore, my own view is that you should not assume that you're going to be paid to take a mortgage out. Um, I don't think that's, that's the case. And bank profitability, which is already under pressure, uh, is being supported by very, very cheap funding from the central bank. And the fact that they're trying to write more and more loans, right, because that's the only game in town. But if you look at the most recent results, profitability is under huge pressure. So they've got significant issues as well. So I agree with you at that point. Whoops. Dustin says, we are the witnessing of the financialization of housing. I just want a cheap house in a cheap rural area. <laughs> yeah, so that's the financialization of property. This is a global situation where essentially property has switched from somewhere to live to an asset class to invest in. And every time I talk to people about property, they almost always switch over to talking about it as an investment class. Now, if you start playing that game, that then allows you to tap into the whole lending thing and to get uh, essentially um, you know, more and more price rises, lifts the value of the property, lifts the value of the mortgage, they can lend more. And so that inflates bank profits, that inflates bank balance sheets. Um, that also, of course, inflates stamp duty. So you can see all the reasons, all the winners in this process, right? But the winners aren't necessarily those who are buying property because they have to actually end up paying more and more and more for a property for somewhere to live. Now, overlay also property investing, and I'm not anti um, property investing, but I want it to be something that is actually balanced between owner-occupied and investing. At the moment, many property investors have tax breaks and financial benefits that normal property owners don't have. I think that's unfair. So I would want a level playing field between two. So it is a really big deal. And so, yeah, that's uh, my take on it. Um, at the end of the day, um, we have to stand back I think, and have a bit of a reset here. But of course, how you do that is the question, because either you say, right, we want property prices to go sideways or come down a little over the long term, and that will then allow uh, essentially um, the um, prices to catch up with, with uh, income. Or you say, we'll just go on stoking it and we'll just keep the uh, the, the Ponzi scheme running a bit more. Now, of course, for that to work, you need to pull more people in the bottom. So they pull forward demand. You offer more incentive for first-time buyers to try and get in at the bottom of the tree to inflate the values more so that effectively everybody wins. And that's the game. The problem we have there is that two-thirds of people in Australia own property. One-third doesn't. And of those two-thirds, half of them have a mortgage and half of them don't. So the fact of the matter is... There is a lot of vested interests in keeping this Ponzi scheme going, this financialization scheme going. And it's a global scheme that the banks benefit from. The central banks around the world rely on it. Governments rely on it. And so that's the problem. It is wired into the very infrastructure of the way that our economy now works. And that is the mistake that we've allowed to be made. How you unwind that is the question. In the meantime, real investments in real productive things is going close to zero. Businesses are hardly investing at the moment. So we simply invest in more property, build more stuff, sell more stuff, lift prices even more, raise debts even more, repeat and continue to repeat. And that's the financialization process. Very hard to unwind, but at least I, st I guess step one is wake up and see that that's what's going on. Tom, I appreciate uh, your commentary there. And thanks for the super chat. One million one bedroom apartments in Sydney, the people want to buy them. Yeah, absolutely. Massive oversupply of units, true in Sydney, true in Melbourne, true in Brisbane, um, and more being built, right? So we have huge, huge numbers of properties. 
and uh, that's a big deal there you go now Dylan's <laughs> common man um, not sure what that related to unless it was some um, perhaps Biden I don't know but anyway thank you for the contribution I really appreciate it that um, certainly helps to cover the cost of what we do so thank you for that uh, what else have we got George makes the point 30% is arbitrary mortgage stress well there are lots of people who define mortgage stress as 30% of income going to repay the mortgage and that is a fixed ratio that's been around for years and years and years and years and years on for no real justification and by the way it's never clear whether it's gross or net income so having a fixed proportion is nuts it doesn't tell you anything that's why I don't do it that way I do it on individual cash flow basis money in money out which I think is a much more powerful way of doing it but I have to keep educating the press when they report my stuff because they keep saying well, mortgage stress 30 percent nuts cookie boy asks about businesses going belly up when the hand up stop yep already seeing it so in my data and I will probably make a separate show on SMEs we are seeing small businesses so these are individual businesses and small and medium enterprises you know up to five to ten people they're the ones right in the sh crossroads of this at the moment um, and of course JobKeeper tended to drift towards the larger companies many of those larger companies reported abnormal profits and did really well nuts in my mind they paid excess dividends all those sorts of things it's the smaller businesses the sole traders many sole traders of course have a mortgage on their property which is also where they live and also supports their business as well that's yet to work through um, remember that the changes to the default and trading practices is now coming so effectively you can now um, be made to close your business down again that's a big that's a big change that's just come through now so I expect to see more businesses struggling over the next few months and moving through the um, restructurings phase and maybe even the closing stage um, I do think this will probably be the second half of the year though it will take some time to really work through so don't expect a massive wave and I'd still think the government's likely to spend more job keeper to try and support some of those businesses they should but I'm also seeing a lot of individual sole traders a lot of um, individual um, for example consultants self-employed consultants who are really up against it at the moment as well as those in the entertainment sector a number of those in the tourist sector a number of those in the education sector so pretty much everywhere you look you can see some of these the good news or the bad news about how look at it is though builders are very busy very very busy guess why because of the um, government support to that particular sector so that we've had an infinite amount of money being thrown at the construction sector but almost nothing supporting many other business sectors who are doing it really difficultly and they're the ones I think are going to fall over first and the interesting one there from um, uh, Li Tutu IE um, that Commonwealth Public Service pensions did not go up in January so no compensation for increased costs yeah we're seeing this across the board and again it goes back to one of the things I see in my data um, there's about one third of households who've got no increase in income over the last year in fact real incomes dropping and that's a combination of as you say pensions not going up in many cases deposit rates dropping um, they're really caught but costs of living are still rising so the inflation rate probably is artificially suppressed but for many people they're really struggling with some of the uh, issues with regard to their uh, um, their, their finances and that's a big deal okay now what else have I got I thought I saw a couple of postcode questions but I seem to can't find them again so I apologize for that um, interesting question here any advice you wish you were given in your early 30s 
I got a good paying job and just bought my first regional property. Any tips for what's next? <laughs> well, I was lucky insofar that I grew up in a household with a bank manager. My father was a bank manager, right? So my father always, always, always underscored the risks of debt. So by the time I got into my early 30s, although I had a mortgage, um, I had a reasonably small mortgage and I had a reasonably good job. And I always, always, always knew where I was, always had a cash flow and always was comfortable that I could repay my mortgage. Now, I have to tell you that there were certain periods where I got very close to the wind, but I never fell over. And that taught me two things. Firstly, um, it's very, very important not to essentially get more and more into debt on the assumption that, oh, I'll pay it later, right? So you might get a mortgage, but then you might think, well, I'll just get a credit card and buy some furniture and do this, do that and the other. So I always believe it's important to try and be a little more sequential. Now, there are many people in the current environment who say, no, 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 that's old fashioned thinking. What you could do now is just you should borrow up to the hilt, rates are really low, and just enjoy it and have it and, you know, sort it out later and, you know, just roll the debt over and move now, you can do that, and there are people who do that and believe that that's the way it should be done. They are very much um, those that the banks love because, of course, the banks make more money from them. But my wonderful piece of, of observation from when I was in the 30s was don't make the bank's profits for them. <laughs> Simply, right? Only do the minimum that you need to get by, and even if that means that you can't necessarily do everything you want on day one, um, you actually have a much more comfortable existence. And I think that's probably still good advice today. I am so concerned by the lack of financial education that we have here in Australia and indeed around the world that people who, when they leave school, know very little about financial things. They sort of have this vague feeling that debt's not a problem. And of course, then they go to university and then have a big student debt to start with. And it goes on from there. So we are wired to, to think that debt's good. And more debt is better and there's not a problem, right? That, for me, is the fundamental fallacy. And so I think people, you know, as they move into that uh, through phase of life, should come to terms with the real question of how much debt is enough debt and how do you deal with debt? Now, other people will disagree, but that's my own doctrine, that's my own philosophy, and that's what I think is really important. So. Okay, what else have we got? Aaron's an interesting question. If you consider doing an episode about Paul Keating, the recession we had to have, can the posh politician announce that today? <laughs> no, they can't. Um, the R word is uh, not allowed to be mentioned. Um, they'll always find a way around it. I can tell you that now. Um, it's a big deal. Um, politicians do not want to tell us the truth. They want to tell us what we want to hear. And that's one of the big fallacies that I think we have at the moment, that our politicians are not doing us any good service at all. Spin, yep. Marketing, speak, yep. But having real good, solid, honest conversations about the real situation, no, not happening. Not happening here, not happening in the US, not happening in the UK, not happening in many other places too. And that's, I think, where the political pendulum has swung to. Hopefully it will swing back later. Um, my own view so yeah there's probably a conversation to be had there about um the paul keating era although you know it was a convenient recession in a way that's another story tony lecantro thank you very much look forward to 26th of january yeah this will be a really good conversation tony given the fact that uh, you had quite a fun year last year right with <laughs> the fall and then the rise uh, question is whether where's the market going next so i look forward to that conversation on the 26th i'm sure you will have lots of questions um cookie boy says do i see negative wage growth in the future well negative wage growth and lack of growth is happening now um, we're also seeing a lot of jobs being outsourced um, Qantas, for example recently outsourced a whole bunch of jobs um, outsourcing is a way of basically resetting um, you know, job uh, pay levels. We're seeing a lot of that. We're going to see more about more gig economy jobs, more part-time jobs, um, full-time jobs. 
Um, they are much rarer than they used to be, and I think it will go on. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting one. Interesting. It's sad each week there's doom and gloom for the average Joe. Well, look, I've got this theory that it's an attitude of mind, right? The first thing that I think is important is that people actually get to see what's really going on. Now, that's a sh sort of a bit of a shock for many people because for quite a few people, they've been living in this sort of um, uh, little bubble, right? And they just sort of merrily go on. I actually think reality is really important to start with, right? And I'm a philosopher, so I'll use it to say that. Then the second point is I think there's much more control that we can have in our future than many people um, believe. So I'm of the view that democracy can work. Look at the cash ban. We actually got that changed, right? But we have to have people who are informed and educated and interested and engaged, and then we can begin to sort of steer some of the conversations in a different direction and make our politicians work for us rather than the other way around. So that, for me, is the positivity that I think is there. And the other thing that I think I want to highlight is that there's a very strong sense of community here on the, on the channel and locally in the area I live. It's been reinforced by the lockdowns and by the, the virus. So more people know each other as a result of that. So that's a positive thing. And I think the final point is that if you look at where we are in Australia relative to many other parts of the world, we're actually in a better position. So we have a potential opportunity to create great things for Australia and Australians. Um, and that should be a positive view. So there are positives, and I do try to make those points sometimes. But I also think it's really important that we get the real, true data, not just the media spin, which is why I spend quite a lot of time doing what I do. Aaron asks whether banks can hold off principal and interest repayments forever. Don't think they can. Uh, APRA has basically said um, by sort of March time, uh, they expect the banks to know whether those loans will come back or not. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some higher levels of default being reported in the second half of the year. Um, APRA may push that out a bit simply because of the fact that the virus is still there. Um, but they can't go on forever. They have ultimately to come to the point as to whether those loans really are bad or not, in my view. And I think we've got high levels of bad debts and the banks are prepared to admit. <laughs> Interesting observation about Mandra. Great standard of living at rock bottom prices. Mm, well, just... Avoid the druggies, you'll probably be all right. Mandra is an interesting place. There are some very nice areas in and around Mandra, but there are also some significant social problems there that have grown over many, many years. And the problem with that is that the social issues were a result of banned political and economic decisions taken way back. And that's the point I want to make, that these things have a way of taking a long time to work through, right? So you can make decisions today. And, you know, for example, all the high-rise stuff that's being built in, in and around Sydney and you know some of the inner suburban suburbs like in Redfern and places like that. Um, in 20 years' time, some of those may well be suburbs that really won't be very pleasant at all. And that's the problem, I think, that the life cycle for some of the outworkings of some of the bad decisions can be quite a long time. Meanwhile, the people who built them just you know, walked away and said, well, I made a quick profit, whoopee. Um, and that's really the problem. So, you know, Mandra is an interesting case, Sally. I still think there are some very significantly worrying factors there, but I'm seeing other places too. And I did say a few years ago that I felt Mandra was a bellwether potentially what we might see more broadly, and I'm looking to see some of the similar signs, social unrest and some of those other issues that I mentioned in other areas. And I'm seeing them in some of the outer suburban areas. Look at some of the crime stats in some of those areas. That will be a leading indicator, I think, as we go ahead. Look, you made another point. When government starts saying giving free money, you need to ask, is it worth the risk? Yeah, good point. Um, remember, the government's there for short-term election purposes, not long-term servicing uh, and servicing us as individuals and as communities. Um, that's um, very, very significant. So there we are. <laughs> 
How do you get the members, including free ones, to be quiet for 120 minutes of choosers? No one apart from the kid's dog would give me a quiet space for that long every week. <laughs> well, here's a trick to it, right? So um, basically, my wife is um, the other end of the house watching TV with the two Kelpies, who are very noisy and very boisterous. Uh, and our third dog, who's an old Labradoodle, um, gets quite tired. Um, I take him out about 7.30 and uh, he wanders around a bit and then goes to sleep and then wakes up about 10 o'clock when I finish. So <laughs> that's how I manage it. Strategic management. And it's <laughs> it's not straightforward, I'll tell you that. Uh, okay, what else have we got? Damien asks, given the US housing crisis created the GFC, how will the failing economies across the globe affect or create another GFC? and therefore falling property prices locally. Well, that's, I think, a very good point. And the fact is that this was created over a long, long period of time. Um, you know, the global financial crisis was the early harbinger. Um, I have to tell you that I think that this has actually gone on for longer than that. It is a fundamentally critical question about the role of debt. So much debt in the whole of the, the economy around the world Un unmanageable, unmanageable amounts of debt. And so all they can do is keep cycling that, keep cycling that. And that's one of the reasons why this whole concept of some sort of uh, of, of reset or something is, is, is appropriate because, you know, you can't go on doing the same and expect a different outcome. You need to do something different. Now, the question is, will central banks do that? No, not in the short term. Central banks will be committed to continued liquidity and continually throwing more and more stuff at the economy to try and keep it. But all the evidence, look at Japan, look at Europe, is that just drives rates lower, deflation, and uh, frankly, more and more of the same. We need a different plan, a different strategy. Not sure where that's going to come from, though. That's the question. Meantime, I do think the consequence of all this ultimately will be falling property prices. And I've said quite often, and I'll say it again, prices here in Australia are 40% over long-term real value, 40%. So we are well above the long-term average. Now, there are reasons why it hasn't corrected so far. But the risks are still there, that it will correct at some point. I'm not going to say when it's going to correct. Um, you know, you can see in my scenarios, most of my scenarios are saying, no, no, the balloon will continue to float a bit further because of all the stimulus and the QE. Ultimately, though, it probably will come back. The risks that I see is that when it does, the consequences will be very serious for individuals, households and, 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 and the government and the Reserve Bank and everybody else. So nobody wants to go there. Everybody wants to try and keep the, um, uh, the, the balloon running a bit further, kick the can down the road, whatever expression you want to use. And they have capacity to continue to do that for quite some period of time with low, very low interest rates. It's just as a one-way street. So the question that you should ask your politicians and the Reserve Bank is what is our exit strategy? How do we get out of this mess? How do we get out of the massive debt that's been written? How do we get out of this over leveraged society that we've got? That's the key question that needs an answer. Can't answer on the show tonight. I've got some ideas, but that's where I think we have to take the conversation. So if it's 9.30, okay. Um, so let me just say this. If you want to get information about a particular postcode, you can send me a message via the DFA blog and I will do what I can in terms of providing you with that postcode level information. Um, there were a few um, super chats that didn't come up on my stream. Um, Greg, thank you very much. Um, um, I locked my super into cash. Should I go back to low risk diversity try strategy? Well, I don't give general financial advice, but I still think that the markets have some upside from this point. Looking at what I'm seeing, question is how long? Um, Dylan says, do you ever worry about the advice that in your property mode over the last few years may have dissuaded people from buying family homes? No, because I have never said don't buy. I've just said make sure that you get the right information to make the right decision. In fact, Look back at some of my earlier posts, which I've where I've specifically said why you might want to buy, particularly for owner occupation, property investing a little bit more wobbly, 
but no, you you are um, frankly um, exaggerating the position that I've taken. Um, what I have said is, don't assume that you're going to get capital growth dramatically like we used to have, right? Um, so thanks for that. Thanks for the contribution. Um, um, Yogi Bear, thanks for that and for Dylan's comment. Yeah, I think I've picked that up now. Um, and Damon says, as Plato said, no one is hated more than someone who speaks the truth. Well, that's probably true. Um, 6230 says Michael. 6230. Okay, well, as I've got that up. Hang on a moment. Let me try and do that for you. We're running out of time. Just hang on a moment. 6230. 6 230. Okay, Bombery and places like that. All right. So this is, let's put that up there. This is 6230, um, 19,000 households, 7,000 borrowing, 9,000 renting, and financial stress at 51%. So that's quite high. 71% in mortgage stress, that's 5,400. 35% in rental stress and 25% in investor stress. And here are the profiles. So I'm predicting house prices, um, if you take my 40% scenario, up 4.4% this next 12 months, coming back just slightly. Units a little bit up as well, in fact, slightly stronger. If you take my other scenario, which is a, a less strong scenario, then a slight fall. So a slight rise, a slight fall is what I'm predicting for that particular postcode at the moment. Um, so there you go. Now. I think I'm pretty much done tonight. Let me just um, go back to my presentation and I will just uh, close out my last conversation points. Um, now, in terms of um, the information, there is a special offer on at the moment. Um, if you want to get the detailed information down to the postcode level, including the price projections at postcode level, there's a special officer offer at the moment using the 50 US dollar Patreon program. You can get a copy of the stress report for January, in fact, up to the end of December, issued in January, and also the three scenarios um, by signing up on Patreon. I've had a few people do that over the last few days. And that means you get this tool, which is part of my spreadsheet, which basically allows you to put in a postcode and then see the three scenarios for the best case, mid case, worst case, based on the latest scenarios that I've gone through tonight for that individual postcode. And it's there for both houses and for units. So if that's something that int might interest you, you can sign up for that on Patreon. And uh, I'll be sending that data out tomorrow. And for those who've signed up already, um, everybody who's signed up will receive it tomorrow. And beyond that, the idea is that um, for as many months as you're signed up for, I will continue to send out the stress information. The price information um, will be made accessible slightly differently, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, oops. Because, where is it? Uh, okay. Yeah, because the modeling is nearly ready to be deployed. And so that model that I showed you briefly tonight, um, the online model, will very shortly be deployed and it will be deployed initially to those people at the $50 US Patreon level. So effectively, you'll be receiving an email um, shortly, probably within the next month or so, to allow uh, people to um, uh, have a look at that and basically access the information directly. So that's the other part of the special offer. So not only do you get the January price movement, but you also then get access to the tool uh, longer term. So that's the offer. Um, in terms of other things, just as I close out, walktheworld.com.au, that's uh, my main site. Um, and we also provide access there through to Walk the World Fund and Walk the World Super for those who are looking for diversified investments in the markets um, worth thinking about. I think at the moment the markets are definitely worth exploring. Um, something which I've uh, I've done. Um, I believe for a long time that um, uh, staying away from the markets made sense. I think there's going to be more upside, but not for that long. So there's a bit of opportunity there. So there's go if you want to get more information, go to walktheworld.com.au. 
Also, the DFA blog contains a whole lot more information, all of our posts and a lot of other information. You can also send me a message at the blog. And there's also a one-to-one -one service where we actually can take people through an individual discussion with a postcode. It's not financial advice, but I can do the detailed modeling analysis. I can look at stress, home price, trend data, etc., etc., uh, at a at a suburb postcode level. And uh, you can book an hour via Zoom with me on that. There is a price simply because it takes money, time, effort for me to do this. And if you're interested, contact me via the DFA blog. Booking is about three weeks ahead at the moment, and I've got quite a few people in train at the moment. Uh, but if you want to get really granular and get my full access of data and interpretation, that's the way of doing it. You can also support me via PayPal if that's what you'd like to do. Make a one-off donation. Would appreciate that. Or indeed via Bitcoin. I do take Bitcoin. Um, for those who think I'm a Luddite, no, Bitcoin is uh, within my portfolio too. And we also do have um, merch as well. Um, I will be updating the merch shortly. Just another story for another day. And I will just quickly mention the more work the world. Um, there is a new YouTube channel called Walk the World Productions, which I launched a couple of days ago. On that channel, I will be doing two things. I will be providing more technical information about the studio. And there's already a, a video there called A Walk Around the Studio. If you're interested in the technical side of how we do what we do, then that's worth visiting. There will also be some back catalogue. So I, I used to use Walk the World as a uh, record of all the trips I used to take and all the shows I used to record. Uh, and so there's a bunch of those up there as well. And so Walk the World Productions will be where I discuss the technical side of what I do and also share some of my posts. The reason I've done that is because every time I did that on my main channel, I had a lot of people who complained about the fact that I was um, wasting their time. So I've created a new channel. And so go across and subscribe and uh, hopefully um, we can grow that channel as well. So that's uh, something else that um, I think uh, will be uh, hopefully quite useful and uh, productive as well. So that's what the World Productions. And you can get a link from that from my uh, normal site. There's a, it's cross-linked below. Now next week I will be taking the household confidence discussion further, looking at the confidence mapping. And I'll specifically be looking at this K question, um, you know, the good and the bad, and where those K factors reside, because that will tell you something about prices as well. So make a note of that, 12th of January, 8 p.m. Sydney time. Um, the good news is there are some other guests coming um, after that, some new ones and some old ones. Um, I'll tell you more about that down the track. There's quite a lot of... Uh, people that I'm talking with, which will effectively be hopefully quite useful. Um, just a few closing remarks uh, from the chat. I like your embarrassed point of view of the economy and property market. Probably need to listen more to people like you instead of following the world. Mainstream media like sheep. <laughs> well, thank you. I agree. I am not trying to push a particular line. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you're probably very well. No, I'm not. I'm just trying to give a better, more balanced view of what's going on. Go granular. Go careful. Do the analysis is what I'm saying. Um, a lot of people, of course, um, um, has difficulty, as uh, uh, Cookie says, um, can't handle the facts. <laughs> there are some who believe the AFR and Sprute Logic words are gospel. That's true. Um, uh, I simply want to say there is an important alternative narrative, which is worth trying to get your head around. Go granular, look at the information, make better decisions. Um, so there you go. Um, somebody asked, yeah, it's 50 US dollars a month. Yeah, but you can subscribe just for a month if you want. You don't have to keep subscribing. It's up to you. So uh, that's just the way I've chosen to do it because that was already set up within, within Patreon. Um, <sighs> do you want to have an easy life and always stay with the herd and lose yourself in the herd? As Nietzsche says, yep, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I'm afraid that I don't like an easy life. I like to have an objective and independent view of what's going on, which is what this channel's all about. Well, I may have missed a few points tonight, and I apologise if I have, but um, hopefully that has been a useful 
conversation. I want to say thank you very much for spending some time with me this evening. Um, as with all of this, I can never get through all the chat. There's always um, uh, a question. Tony Lacantro. Uh, <laughs> very good. Um, from I'm very similar. Night every night. Night everyone. A cup of tea with my 9.5 awaits. Sounds pretty good to me. So there you go. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thanks for spending it with me. I wish you a very happy evening. Happy New Year. We'll be back next week with more content and then more guests coming as well. And uh, follow our other channel and follow our continued posts because we've always got more to say. We're going to try and do a bit more philosophy as well and a few other things too. So thanks once again for your time. And as I said, if you need a particular postcode, drop me a message via the DFA blog and I will send you back the individual postcode data. No charge. See you next time. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off.